The world of Roman children flourished in the center of the greatest empire of the ancient world, among the splendor of the Colosseum and the activity of the Roman Forum. This was a world that was distinct from the adult world. This facet of Roman society was a microcosm of the empire as a whole, reflecting its ideals, hierarchies, and complexity in a way that is frequently missed. But can you imagine what it was like to grow up in ancient Rome? How did they pass the time? And what part did religion and superstition play in their everyday lives? What impact did their socioeconomic position have on the things they did and saw? And how did they handle the change from being children to being adults? The deadly reality of being born in ancient Rome. Even before they were born, Roman children were subjected to a variety of rituals and superstitions associated with pregnancy, labor, and delivery. Due to the fact that childbirth was a risky activity in ancient Rome, expectant mothers were held in high esteem and given special protection. Childbirth was considered a dangerous endeavor. The terrible truth of the situation at the time was the high infant mortality rate, which meant that many children did not live past their first year. The brutal reality of the situation was reflected in the decision to postpone official naming rituals until after the newborn had made it through the perilous first few days of life. The arrival of a new member into a Roman family was an occasion worthy of celebration. A midwife, sometimes known as a obstetrix, was an important woman who was there during the procedure and supplied the mother with care and assistance. She oversaw it. Immediately after the delivery, the infant was laid on the ground, and according to a tradition known as tolere, the father wouldn't be allowed to pick up the kid until he made the decision to acknowledge and accept the child into the family. This gesture served as a symbolic representation of the patriarch accepting responsibility for the upbringing of the kid. In ancient Rome, infancy was a time of extreme dependence and close parental supervision. It was a widespread practice that was believed at the time to assist the newborn in developing strong muscles and a straight spine. Additionally, wet nursing was common, particularly among the families of higher socioeconomic status. In some instances, slaves or servants were employed to nurse and care for the kid, which highlights the class disparities that were ingrained in Roman society from the very early stages of life onward. How did a child get their name? In ancient Rome, giving a child a name was not merely an expression of one's individual taste, but rather a momentous occasion that was deeply rooted in custom and had important repercussions for society. The naming ceremony, also known as Dies Lustricus, took place nine days after birth for boys and eight days after birth for girls. The event was done in Latin. The high infant mortality rate resulted in this delay, and the ceremony itself was viewed as a celebration of the child's survival. Roman names were imbued with profound symbolism and frequently served as an early indicator of a child's position within the family and society. Traditionally, young boys were given three names which were collectively referred to as their tria nomina. These names included a personal name, praenomen, a family name, nomen, and a name that indicated their larger clan or tribe, cognomen. Girls, on the other hand, were frequently given a feminine form of their father's nomen. If there were more than one daughter, they were sometimes differentiated from one another using numerical designations such as prima, secunda, tertia, and so on. A child's social standing at birth was substantially represented in their given name, as this status was largely determined at the time of the child's birth. The offspring of the patrician class, which was the highest social rank, were frequently given a large selection of names from which to pick, whereas the names available to the plebeians, who were the ordinary people, were more limited. Slaves, who were regarded property rather than citizens, did not have the privilege of the tria nomina, and were only granted a single name by their masters. This was because slaves were not considered citizens. What was family life like? Family life in ancient Rome was marked by a complicated interplay of roles and responsibilities, which was profoundly impacted by social standing as well as by long-established customs. The patriarch of the Roman family, known as the paterfamilias, was considered to be the most important member of the familia, or family. He had complete control over the family and even had the ability to decide his children's fates, giving him full dominion. Evidence reveals that many Roman fathers were affectionate and caring towards their children, despite the supposedly severe framework that they were subjected to. The mother in a Roman family was largely responsible for maintaining the household and caring for the children. She was in charge of running the family. 
which included taking care of the children and ensuring that the daughters received an appropriate education. The Roman matron was a figure of respect and authority inside the family, despite the fact that the majority of her responsibilities were domestic. The lives of Roman children were heavily influenced by their relationships with their siblings. It was common practice for older siblings, and particularly brothers, to take an active role in the rearing of their younger siblings. This was especially true in the event that a parent passed away at a young age, which, given the average life expectancy in ancient Rome, was a rather typical occurrence. Slaves played an important part in Roman family life, particularly in houses of higher socioeconomic status. They were responsible for a wide range of responsibilities, including household chores and providing academic guidance to the kids. Slaves were often present in the life of Roman children, serving in roles such as caregivers and companions. In some situations, this was the case. The formal structure and rigorous roles within Roman households did not prevent them from showing warmth and affection for one another. Children were treasured, and their accomplishments were cause for celebration. Meals together as a family, celebrations of many religions and games played in public were all times that brought our family closer together and brought us joy. Did Roman children go to school? In Roman society, the parents, particularly the mother, were primarily responsible for their children's education in the early years. In the early years, children received their education at home, where they were taught not just the fundamentals of reading, writing, and arithmetic, but also the ethical teachings that might be gleaned from history and mythology. Knowledge and abilities that could be applied in real-world situations were emphasized heavily as the primary means of preparing students for adulthood. The more the youngster matured, the more regimented and demanding the child's official education became. The children of wealthy households typically received academic instruction from private tutors or attended one of the numerous small private schools known as ludus. These institutions, which were led by a figure known as a ludi magister, were responsible for imparting knowledge in more complex topics, including grammar, rhetoric, and even philosophy and music on occasion. On the other hand, access to education was not available to everyone. Girls' education was frequently restricted to homemaking skills, and the education of slaves was typically non-existent altogether. On the other hand, boys from all socioeconomic groups had some access to school. The role that slaves played in Roman schooling is an intriguing feature of Roman culture. Pedagogists were educated slaves who were employed by wealthy families to teach their children. This practice was common in ancient Rome. These slaves were highly respected and played an important part in the intellectual growth of the young charges that they were responsible for. Why Roman children were forced to go to work In ancient Rome, the concept of infancy had a very different meaning than it has today. These two conceptions of childhood are very distinct from one another. It was usual practice for children to begin contributing to the financial well-being of their families at an early age because they were frequently treated as miniature grown-ups. This was especially true among the lower classes, where the necessity of earning a living frequently took precedence over the luxury of a more extended childhood. In ancient Rome, the use of children for labor was not widely regarded as exploitative or damaging to the mental and physical growth of the children involved. Instead, work was regarded as an essential component of maturing, a chance for children to get experience in the real world and contribute to the financial well-being of their families. The social standing and line of work of a child's family had a significant impact on the kinds of jobs that were available to them when they were young. Children who came from farming families often helped out in the fields, while those who came from artistic households could pitch in at the family studio. The practice of serving an apprenticeship was widespread, particularly within the trades. A young kid might be sent to live with an experienced craftsman and learn a profession from him over the course of several years while also gaining the necessary abilities for the trade. Apprenticeship was not just a method of acquiring skills, but also a type of socialization in which the apprentice gained an understanding of the standards and values held by the community of tradespeople. The majority of a girl's responsibilities were expected to revolve around the house. They were instructed in domestic skills such as cooking, weaving, and running a household from an early age on in their upbringing. It was believed that these abilities would serve them well in their future vocations as husbands and mothers. What did Roman children do for fun? 
Even though children in ancient Rome had to start working at a young age and face the challenges of a rigorous education, they nevertheless managed to find time for play and leisure. These activities were not only a way to pass the time and have some fun, but they also played a vital role in the mental and physical development of a youngster. Roman children's games frequently mirrored the pursuits of Roman adults, which served as a type of play-based education for the young people of Rome. Young boys would imitate the great gladiators and charioteers they adored by playing with toy versions of their weapons and chariots. Girls, on the other hand, mimicked their future duties as spouses and mothers by playing with dolls that were intricately constructed and frequently featured moving limbs. These dolls were typically clad in miniature togas. Children of varying socioeconomic backgrounds enjoyed playing board games together. The game known as Ludus Latrunculorum, which is comparable to chess or checkers, was a popular recreational activity. Tabula, a game similar to backgammon that came before it, was also very popular at the time. The children gained not just a sense of enjoyment from playing them, but also the ability to think strategically and solve problems thanks to these games. Because of the positive effects on one's health, participation in outdoor activities and sports was actively encouraged. The kids had fun playing ball games, swimming and acting out fights with pretend weapons. These exercises encouraged boys, particularly those who were expected to serve in the military, to maintain a healthy level of physical fitness, which was highly valued in Roman culture. The celebrations of festivals and holidays were always opportunities for unique games and shows. During the celebration known as Saturnalia, which took place in December, societal standards were momentarily disregarded, and youngsters were given the opportunity to gamble, which is a privilege that is often reserved for adults. How and when did children become adults? In ancient Rome, the passage from childhood to adulthood was marked by elaborate rituals and ceremonies, which symbolized the child's new status as an adult and the obligations that came along with it. Having said that, not every child went through this process in the same way. It varied according on a person's gender, socioeconomic level, and the customs of their family. The Toga Virilis Ceremony, also known as the Toga of Manhood Ceremony, was the most important rite of passage for young men in the Tonga culture. This often occurred somewhere around the age of 16, but it was subject to change based on the decision made by the family. During this event, the kid would shed the toga pretexta, which is a toga with a purple border that is worn by youngsters, and don the toga virilis, which is a plain toga, to signify his transition into manhood. After this, there was typically a public ceremony as well as a feast for the family. After reaching this milestone, the young man became eligible for military service and gained the ability to participate in public affairs. Marriage, rather than a rite of passage or other event, signified the passage from girlhood to femininity for young women. Roman girls were frequently married off when they were still in their early teens, typically to much older men than their betrothed. The wedding ceremony, with its rituals of dowry, procession, and the carrying of the bride over the threshold, represented the girl's passage into maturity and her new duty as a wife. The ceremony also carried with it the tradition of carrying the bride over the threshold. Coming of age was an important milestone in the life of a Roman kid since it marked the end of childhood and the beginning of adult responsibilities. It was a time of transition and development that was marked by feelings of both exhilaration and trepidation. We hope you like this video, subscribe to the channel if you're a history addict, and please let us know about what civilization or time period we should talk about. Also, watch another video here.